and see if we can p pull out some, some trends in them uh, that are similar. Now, goodness. Oh, well, my cat feed us, sorry. Yeah. Welcome, FC Dallas Curious fans, to episode 100 and Matt Hedges of Third Degree, the podcast. That's 124 if you weren't following along. Uh, I am obviously not the usual host, Peter Waltham. I am Buzz Carrick. Peter is a late scratch. He's uh, done his groin like Faco has, and he's out with me as my good friend, Dan. Dan, we're going to talk some FC Dallas. You'll be ready. We are, but I heard a nasty rumor. He's actually just still on a, what would it be, like a five or six day bender now after Man United beat Leeds. <laughs> yeah, after that. Yeah, uh, probably so. Uh, how yeah. is Man I mean, United when, doing? When Fred, sto when Fred scores, you're probably drunk, right? So, yeah, yeah, probably. Probably. I'll just be happy if Newcastle stays up. Uh, All right, Dan, you know, of course, that Third Degree the Podcast is brought to you by Soccer 90. I'm sure you know that. I had an idea. Yeah. Did you know that today, Third Degree and Third Degree listeners get to be the first people to learn about and roll out the brand new Dallas Tornado t-shirt? Whoa. Yeah, it's uh, got some sort of blue coloring that fits in line with the current FC Dallas looks. And you can get that uh, brand new Tornado t-shirt exclusively at Soccer 90 and uh, while supplies last. And of course, our code does work, 25% off for anyone who uses the code. But right now, if you're hearing this podcast within the first, I don't know, 24 hours or so of it dropping then you will know about this t-shirt and no one else will. So be sure and get there quick and get yourself one. Uh, and what was that code? Third degree. Just like wow. the name of the website. The number three, R-D-D-E-G-R-E-E. -E. Third degree is the code. And get yourself a snappy t-shirt. I will be getting one as soon as we're done here. <laughs> All right. If I, if I go quiet and you just hit click in, it's me yeah. ordering a t-shirt. Yeah. Uh, that'll go up probably down around eight o'clock here. Uh, Thursday night will probably when that shirt will pop up on the website, you know? So if you're hearing this podcast around that same time, go get yourself a shirt. Okay. Well, Dan, uh, not the week that we were hoping for or expecting for after Dallas effectively had, you know, pretty good road results and then came home, you know, and everyone's thinking, great. Got some home games. This is going to be awesome. You get a good result against Austin. Yeah, not, not so much uh, two straight losses to, admittedly, the best two teams in the Western Conference, but these are the teams who rolled over for them on the road previously. I'm tempted to blame uh, Garrett Melker, but uh, perhaps for pointing out all the home streaks. Well, <laughs> I, I, think, uh, I think Peter deserves a share of the blame for the second one because he did tell us, at least, that it had been eight years since FC Dallas had dropped mm. consecutive home games. Mm, yeah, that's brutal. Well, listen... You know, we talk about home advantage in soccer in MLS particular all the time and how strong it is. And Dallas had been on this one loss in 31 game streak. Admittedly, it is a huge advantage they have here. I don't know if the team bought into that thinking or if it's just a question of having gotten road points against those two, two teams. Those two teams were now pissed and came in here either way. I actually have a theory about why we're going to get to in a minute. But let's talk about these two games collective. So there's a couple of trends that across both of these games I think are worth discussing. Now, Dallas, I think, in both games played relatively well. They were, they were not poor performances where they got played off the pitch. Both, both games, they created a fair number of chances. They created a fair number of shots. But their finishing was not as good. Both of these teams, you saw... The reason why they're at the top of the Western Conference, these teams are clinical. They put the ball game away when they need to. Their big-time players came in and made big-time moves and won the game. Now, uh, in both games, it's against Sporting Kansas City, Dallas had 16 shots against Seattle, 18. Against Sporting Kansas City, they had 12 key passes. And against Seattle, they had 14. So there's definitely a trend of Dallas playing relatively well. Possession was pretty close to the, even on both games. Dallas was less on one and more on the other based on, you know, who had leads and when. Uh, 
So overall, right now, it's not like they're bad games, but these small differences, Dan, and I think you'll agree with me here, these small differences in this ability to be clinical and the ability to have a big game player make the difference, that's why teams are good and teams in the MLS are not good. Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, you know, I, I uh, we are talking about both games. I didn't get to see this bullet in Kansas City game, um, but certainly... Mm-hmm. You know, last night you had a, a team that started a virtual reserve team. They, well, it was a reserve team. It was uh, seven changes. And you managed two shots on target against them. Oh, sorry. You managed one shot on target before they managed to bring their, their key players in, which in exactly 30 seconds then went and scored. You know, you had the opportunity at least then to, which, you know, you should in any home game, is to set the tone to kind of force the away side to try and chase the game, make it really difficult create that adversity that, that Lucci likes to uh, talk about and Oscar liked to talk about before him um, and and it wasn't it was it was a little too passive in places yeah the big trend the big worrying trend of these two games is the shots on target as you mentioned were very low I think it was one and two in the two games or vice versa that is a concern that has not been a problem this year but if it, that continues going forward we are going to be worried about it. Now, I, I think here's my I have two items that are my theory on why this outage happened in these two games. Again, uh, Seattle's only given up like eight goals from run of play all year. Sporting is also a phenomenal defensive team. So these are very good teams, number one, defensively in, in particular. But I think item number one of my theory is that Ricardo Pepe is now getting attention. You know, the hat trick, the youngest player in the league to get one. He's now an all-star. Well, if you're not really paying attention to FC Dallas only when you're going to play them, maybe you don't know Pepe's a thing. Well, now he's a thing, and now teams are focusing on him, and he's getting a lot of focus, and he's not getting as clean of opportunities as he was, I don't think. No, definitely not. I mean, uh, you know, uh, aside from that front post effort uh, late on in, in the game yesterday, I mean, he was pretty cold and that really only came because he got sort of squeezed out right out wide for Hara uh, in the second half. Yeah. The item number two of my personal theory about these two particular games, and I don't think this is a coincidence for sure, is that Paxton Pomichol got a knock in the first half of the sporting game and was subbed at halftime and then didn't play against Seattle. Uh, I don't think it's a coincidence that your most creative, most game-breaking, most challenging, most chaos-making player is basically non-existent for these two games. Um, Not a coincidence for me that you didn't create a lot offensively. You created opportunities, but not great scoring moments and not getting shots on target. Yeah, absolutely. And and it kind of plays in hand till we talk about uh, Jesus having to drop back for the ball. You know, those are the times that Paxton isn't there to make those passes that you've got Jesus and Pepe and you know, or or Haro or whoever kind of drop him back for those passes and you end up with, you know, guys like Ricarte playing almost as a, you know, playing almost as a six when he's clearly not designed to be playing as a six in that instance or Ferreira playing as a as an eight when he's kind of more as that, you know, 10 profile. Uh, especially, uh, you know, teams know they can compress down and really uh, tighten those lines and, if you don't have a guy who can make those that quality of passing, it's just impossible to get through them. Now, I'm going to get to some differences in these two games a little further down, but there were still a couple of trends I want to get through that were for both of these games. Uh, number one, uh, Shabalk Shun was, for me, the most dangerous player for Dallas across both of these eight games together. Now, he wasn't my man of the match in either game, but he collectively across both games was by far the most dangerous and active player I know you didn't see the one game, but uh, he's playing clearly the best soccer that he's played since he got here. And he's become, I mean, clear first choice player, clear, clearly an important player. And really a guy that we, that I would say probably needs to play the rest of the way, no matter what. Yeah. And and Lucci actually alluded to in the uh, press conference after he is kind of one of, uh, what is it? Three players that uh, are now like the, the set priest guys, uh, along with uh, Acosta and uh, Jesus, which means Ricarte's apparently fallen off. Yeah, Ricarte's not getting a lot of minutes at the minute. All right, trend number two across both of these games. Uh, this one's interesting for me because 
Matt Hedges is back, healthy, ish. Jose Martinez is back, healthy, ish. Brisson had to sit one game, but then he was back. But the guy that played both games and was arguably Dallas's best defender again is Nikosi Tafari. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, he's he's the form guy at the moment. I think, uh, you know, unfortunately, you're looking at a, a lot of health related problems in the, in the back line. Um, you know, Lucci's kind of bemoaned that a few times now that they they are restricted health wise. Well, it's it's the part that's most interesting to me about this, Dan. It's it's not that Tafari is good because we've been seeing him good now for quite a bit. It's that he's the first choice clearly at this point, at least in my mind, above these other three guys. I mean, at this point, it's Tafari and one of them. I mean, who's going to play? Matt Hedges, Jose Martinez, or Brisson? I mean, Brisson, after the one-game suspension, Matt Hedges was solid. Uh, Brisson immediately came right back in. And Brisson had a pretty good game. So it'll be really interesting to see if, going forward, how that four, how those four players work out. I mean, you could make the case it's four players for two spots. And I think you can make the case that it's really Tafari in one and then three players for the other spot. So, so that's a fascinating turn of affairs relative to the start of the season. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going to be really interesting when uh, Hedges is truly fit. I mean, he's had a long layoff and, and when uh, Jose's uh, fit as well. Um, it, it was, I mean, obviously, you know, you, you had uh, Martinez down to uh, start in the lineup prediction and I thought that was... You know, I thought that would have been the right call. Um, you know, Brisson, as I say, didn't have a bad game. You know, that 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 one switch off on the goal was unfortunate. Um, but yeah. that said, the team collectively switched off and didn't close down um, Ladero either. So, which to create that opportunity, um, it's just, yeah, he's. Uh, so you know, you you still kind of get that feeling that he may give away a a foul in a really bad area at any given time. Yeah, I had that down as a Brisson uh, switch off to moment. Um, if I think all four guys are healthy, then I don't think Brisson's my choice, certainly, but maybe it is Lucci's. That that would be amazing. You know, if you're, since you're talking about the person playing left, you'd think it'd be Martinez, you know. And and if here's the here's the real question, Dan, I'd love to hear what you think on this. Is this team bad enough this season that and let's think let's think about just thinking about Tafari. Is this team bad enough this season that you should play Tafari no matter what for the future, the rest of the season? That it's worth it to invest in him the rest of the season, rather than say, think that you can squeeze into the playoffs maybe if you go Martinez Brisson, for example. I mean, I would certainly keep him in the rotation in that instance. Uh, you know, he's what twenty four, twenty five, which for a defender is is you know <laughs> a good few years below peak. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, I think you know, fortunately, I don't think that that decision really even matters right now because he's just there on merit. Yeah, I, I would agree with that too. I agree with that too. All right, here's my here's my last trending thing across both games. Ryan Hollingshead seems to have altered his game. You know, there there was a stretch where he was having some bad defensive moments, and then he cleaned that up by basically locking down and being super defensive focused right when they switched to the four four one one thing. But now he's starting to venture forward a little bit more. Um, but he's still not going back to where he was. There's a little more of a balance, perhaps some less risk taking happening on his part. Do you like this version of Ryan Hollingshead, this sort of paying attention to the defense and not getting forward as much? I mean, the, the shape doesn't lend itself to the modern attacking outside back as much. Um, I, I mean, uh, you know, you win you win games and championships on clean sheets. Uh, so having a, a defender who's more defense first is always, you know, always going to be a good thing. I think every time... Someone nationally says, "Oh, Ryan Holland's head's fantastic. He's the best left back in the league. Anytime he scores or gets an assist, you know." Here we're like, "Yeah, but he's not really defending that well." No, um, you know, he there was that one moment. Um, he actually on. I know we, we're calling it a Brisson switch off uh, on Rui Diaz. Holland's head was the one that was actually chasing him uh, mm. in towards the box. Um, the goal that got disallowed actually came from Holland's head getting caught, 
you know, a good 20, 30 yards out of position, leaving uh, Kellen Rowan acres of space. Yeah, it, it's important to emphasize how I think how big a deal defense really is in this league. And I think one of the deficiencies Dallas has had this year is the defensive troubles. They've allowed 28 goals, which is one, two, three, <laughs> four, five, six, six worst uh, in the Western Conference. And it's no coincidence that teams one, four, five, and two are the bottom four in goals allowed. The only one that's an aberration is LA, the Galaxy. They've allowed 30, but um, they, they have a plus one, strangely enough, uh, goal differential, and yet they are way up on the points. But if you look at the rest of the teams in the league, Seattle plus 17, Kansas City plus 15, and then teams four and five, Colorado plus nine, Salt Lake plus eight. So there's no coincidence that those teams that can hold down the defensive numbers are at the top of the Western Conference. The defense matters. Oh, 100%. And, uh, you know, the SKC game, uh, probably less so, but, you know, you've just gone through two games where you've uh, you've you've been shot out. Uh, you've got, in both games, weirdly, 16 shots total, two on target. Um, looking at, at the Seattle game, Seattle only had one shot on target. They only needed it. Yeah, just they the one. They only needed one. Um, yeah. Because they're, you know... Their defense creates situations. It's, uh, you know, anyone who watched, uh, you know, the Premier League in the 90s would know the phrase boring, boring Arsenal because every game it was 1-0, 1-0, 1-0, 1-0. That's all they need. Yeah. Seattle had nine shots total and one on goal. Kansas City had 11 shots total and six on goal. You know, nine and 11 shots, is you, you like that at home. Six on goal from Kansas City, that's problematic. You don't like that at all. And certainly, as we talked about before with Seattle, they played a bunch of reserves and brought on their big gun for like two minutes, got one goal, and that was it. You know, that's all she wrote. And then they locked it down defensively. So, you know, these are the teams that are good and they're at the top of the standings for a reason, and Dallas is not there, and there's just a deficiency, relatively speaking. Some of it is tactical. Some of it is experience. Some of it is quality of the high-end pieces. Dallas has got a DP that's worthless, you know, they're even missing a third DP. There's no young DPs. It's, it's a different level of talent on these rosters. Yeah, and, and just, just the mental aspect of it as well. You know, these are two teams that are going through uh, the League's Cup thing, uh, and Seattle are actually taking it seriously. So, you know, they you know, won their game. They beat Portland, and then they were like, yeah, we're going to roll the reserves in. And they kept that mentality of just knowing that if they need to switch it on, which they did, they switch it on. I mean, that's, you know, you, you kind of had, yeah. I would say there was kind of some, you know, you know, there was some mental fragility in, in the FC Dallas lineup, uh, particularly towards the end. You know, they're playing like they're 3-0 up. Actually, the the way I, I was talking to uh, John Arnold in the press box, I was like, it's weird. You know that when you play and you can see the goal and everyone's like, all right, guys, nil nil, start again. It's like they went... Okay, guys, nil nil, start again. Oh, we got a point. That's good. We'll settle for that. <laughs> and settle for a point. Yeah, that's not good. All right. Well, I agree that uh, you know Seattle has the ability, particularly to, to turn it on when they want. For me, they're definitely the best team in the league. I don't care about points. Uh, you know that. I mean, obviously, points matter. But like when you, if you compare them to New England or Sporting, I think Seattle's got the difference. You know, and they're doing a lot of it banged up too, which is even more amazing. All right, so let's get to some of the differences in these two games. Now, I know, again, not to harp on it, but you didn't see the sporting game. For that game, and the reason I bring it up is because of I want to talk about Lucci subbing again. So, for me, in the sporting game, Jesus Ferrer was the man of the match. I think I said in my instant reaction thing that it might have been his best game of the season. He was really, really good. Uh, He was staying higher. He was making the runs into the box. He wasn't coming back looking for the ball. And then, late in the game... (laughs) down trying to chase it Lucci subbed out both Jesus and Shun who for me were definitely the two best players in the game for Dallas and he yanked both of them out and this comes back to this idea again for me and I brought it up a whole lot that if you're chasing the game putting on a like player for a like player does very little good the chances that the guy who didn't start are that much better than the guy who did start are infinitesimally small You have to make a tactical shift. You have to bring on a defender, uh, sorry, an attacker for a defender and roll the dice and throw on an extra guy. Yanking out your best two players definitely does not get you back in the game unless 
you think that it's time to just give this game up. And I hopefully that's not what the case. Yeah, I mean, unless someone's uh, really fatigued or carrying a knock, the, those light flow changes just, uh, they're almost lazy. But at the same time, I guess when you're kind of deciding a bench, and particularly when you've got a thin bench of injuries, you're uh, you're kind of looking at it pretty pragmatically of, all right, well, I want, I want a center back, I want a wing back, I want, a, I, I want someone who can play as a six or an eight. I want, you know, it's just, yeah, it's... Uh, but those are those are some strange subs. If if you've got guys with all the momentum going on, uh, and you've already burned two subs at that uh, pretty early on at that point, it's it's just a strange decision. Especially you know the two guys you're bringing on in that instance, Freddie Vargas and Frank O'Hara, really have shown absolutely nothing. Right. You pull off your most dynamic attackers in that specifically in that particular game. And you bring on two guys who are not even close to being able to get it done this year. This is a baffling set of subs for, for me. You know, later on, I, I Ricarte for a Faco, I buy that one. You're bringing on a creative 10 type for a six. That one makes sense to me. But the other two, it's like how you're not looking to bring off a defender and bring on an attacker is beyond me, particularly because in the very next game, the Seattle game, and I mentioned this in my three things, he brings on Khalil for uh, Ima Tuomasi. Now, at that point, Ima's playing right back. He's been playing right back a lot this season, but Khalil is a pure winger. He's, he's not back there playing defense. He comes on. He immediately goes all the way up to the front to play right wing, leaving basically three at the back, and they take Pepe and they shift him in to make like a two-man, hard Pepe middle. Now, of course, Khalil ran his ass all the way back you know, a couple of times to defend. But for the most part, it was three at the back with the extra winger on and two strikers. That's how you make that rotation. So in two days, did Lucci finally realize yeah, that this I is did. how you sub? And I loved seeing that. I mean, Lucci talks so much about formations and shapes and how they don't really matter too much. It's what you do in the motion. And that was it. He played an asymmetric shape. Khalil had the entire right side. Pepe tucked in as a second striker. I mean that forced that that basically forced the uh, the best chance of the game for Dallas. Really, the, I mean the only shot in the box. Um, it you know that that's when you make the changes. The whole it, it was a little bit weird late going switching. Um, you know, trying to switch both sides together, but yeah, yeah, making that change. Freddie Vargas actually looked really good because they were kind of shuffling over to the left a little bit. So he was able to make those cutbacks into the box. Um, you know, not full in the knowledge that Khalil and, you know, Pepe, if he needed to step out, had that right side. It, it was it was good to see. It was great adaptation. And it was it was kind of true to what Lucci says, which quite often what he does and what he says are, are pretty different things. Yeah, there are times when he seems to really get this idea. It doesn't happen as nearly as much as I would like. And we've pointed it out on six different games this year when he's failed to make this kind of alteration, when the alteration has simply been like for like, and it hasn't worked. So sometimes I think Lucci gets lost in the details. Perhaps I, I might call that overthinking it from time to time. And I'll give you another example of overthinking it. The sporting Kansas city game, the a week and a half before they had a positive result in sporting Kansas city when they had the double six look. Now that's a road situation. It's a grindy situation. They particularly had an emphasis where one of the sixes was stepped from forward onto their central mid, their six in order to buy uh, to snuff out something that was successful against them. So it works. They went on the road. Uh, so they come back and they, and they, they want to run out the same sort of philosophy, the same mentality. And so they run out of double six. Well, how many times have we talked about the idea that at home in particular, you need to be on a progressive footing. You need to, you cannot come in and go on a grindy double pivot look at home and you lose that game. Now at halftime, Edwin Surreal got yanked. I don't think for his play, I think he got yanked because it wasn't working because you had two guys playing sideways and there was no progressive passer. You bring in Brian Acosta instantly. FC Dallas looks better in the second half. Now, of course, they're down, but they look better in the second half, and they're starting to do things. They're starting to make things happen because the cost is playing the ball forward. So, again, you overthought it. Yes, bring the, the road success back to home, but make the accommodations you do because you're at home of having a progressive passer in that situation. Yeah, and, and you know, it was uh, it was a little bit 
it was almost too little too late. You know, the first half, uh, Seattle were playing a very, very open formation. They had the, the back five. I mean, it's supposed to be like a 5 3 2, 5 4 1. Um, but it played as a complete flat front three. And then you had um, well, Atencio and, and Leva just kind of spread very wide apart in the midfield. Just they almost abandoned the midfield. You gave you gave the opportunity for, uh, for for Dallas to kind of advance through the midfield, and they just they couldn't take it. By the time Lucci reacted, Schmetz had uh, you know really compressed that formation down, and you know to the point where your defender and your strikers maybe twenty five yards away from each other. Yeah, essentially, you know, Lucci realizes a mistake from the sporting and he starts with Acosta in there and then does the same thing, as you just mentioned, to effect. Pulls out Edwin and brings in Ricarte and puts Acosta into a sixth look and he gets an even more progressive sort of passer in Ricarte. But again, you know, doing that in the 64th minute is way too late in the game. You know, I, I, I with you, I thought that that could have happened much earlier uh, to get that even more progressive passer in the game. You know, we've talked a lot about Edwin's progression lately. And I think it's just come at a bad time that they got these two negative results when he was starting. I don't necessarily think that's on him, other than the recognition of uh, Shirio and, and Faco are basically the same player. So like if you if you put them both in there or, or swap in one for the other, you're not likely to get a different result. You're kind of going to get the same thing. No, absolutely. And I, I think it's you know, a testament to him that you know when there is an attractive option to put uh, Riccate in, uh, from the start and kind of and drop Acosta back as a, a single six. Lucci's look beyond that and, and given uh, Sarrio the start. Yeah, the, this team's got some structural issues that they're going to have to figure out. I, I, I We'll talk about how things are going to go forward in just a little bit, but uh, I'm not super optimistic anymore. All right, one last thing from the Seattle game. My man of the match was Ima Tuomasi. I thought he was phenomenal. He had five dribbles, and I think it was six crosses somewhere in that neck of the woods on the crosses. Uh, he's looking more and more confident, more and more like the prototypical flying outside back that we've seen in Cannon and Brian Reynolds. Uh, as I said in my three things, the next stage of progression for him will be uh, learning to make his crossing and his dribbling and his combinations impactful. Um, now, Dallas didn't score in this, either one of these two games, but when he can learn to combine and link that play into what's happening on the front line, that'll be the next phase of progression for him. If he maintains the spot, that'll be the interesting question is it Lucci who's wants to be so disciplined defensively. Will he go back to the more defensive minded, more disciplined, more traditional flat for Justin Che, or will he stick with this modern flying winger that he seems to have found in Tua Masi? guess that depends on um how much they want to put chain in the shop window yeah and how desperate they are for points on the road i suppose yeah. lucci tends to be so grindy in his road preparation you know that that it makes me think that they might lean back towards justin che uh which for me is a bummer because chase future is not a right back it's in the middle and and two amasi might be your right back here for several years based on what we've seen so far. I, I, I think Eddie Munjoma is not looking like the part at this point, certainly compared to what Tua Masi's doing. Yeah, I mean, uh, he's not even... Uh, yeah, I mean, to go back to North Texas, I see is kind of uh, sort of saying, hey, you're, you're really not ready for the start just yet, but thanks. Yeah, the, the fact that we've seen people like... Khalil now summon it right back or in training when they've brought in... They actually brought up... Um, a, uh, even even Almaguer the other day to bring in a body that can play right back and center back combo, you know, rather than looking at Manjoma, it's just uh, Manjoma needs to do some things to get back in Eddie's good graces. He needs to dominate the North Texas for a, a bit. And, and the problem is, is for a guy his age coming to be an out of college player, this is season number two. Uh, the clock's ticking on his future, particularly when Tuomasi is doing what Tuomasi is doing. Uh, it was kind of ironic when uh, Khalil came on because he played Eddie's position from SMU. Yeah. Just yeah. clear the side out. I'm, I've got it. <laughs> that is, you're right. That is exactly the position Eddie played, to clear the whole right side of the field. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, sp speaking of uh, uh, progression in games, did you notice that uh, Brian Acosta's changed up his long shot a little bit? I did not. What was the difference? Uh, he's kind of... 
rather than taking a square on at goal and just kind of getting his laces behind it, he is now kind of uh, he, he's leaning forward into the shot shooting lower, and he is actually coming from a wider position. Uh, he had one that just cleared like just cleared the upper ninety uh, against Seattle, and it was the cleanest I've seen him strike a ball since that goal against LA. I did notice that they were the three, I think it was three shots he had. I did notice that all three of them were lower than they've been in the past. Uh, I didn't put that down to his technique, but I'm, if that's true, then I'm good to, glad to see that because, I mean, go ahead. I, I, I was going to say, I mean, it'd be interesting to know if he's been working with uh, Pete Lucene or, or, or Trivera on that because that it, it just seemed like a, uh, like a technical change, it's kind of you know, like a golf of regripping his swing or something like that. Yeah, uh, just to kind of have, you know, less of the moon shots and more of the. Well, if you're going to miss it, at least hit the wall. That's interesting. I'll have to see if I can get somebody else to answer to that. Uh, a, a guy at his age to look at a little bit of a change like that is really fascinating. Uh, we'll, see, you know, in a lot of ways, he's been Dallas's best player over the whole season. So I'm actually glad to see him back in the lineup, and I think Dallas will benefit greatly if if he maintains that spot going down the rest of the season. Absolutely, and even just to, you know having his his head doesn't drop. You know, like there was a there was a ball that came out to him from a corner. Uh, sorry, he took a corner. It was clear back out to him, and he nearly curls it over to keep his head. Just uh, you know where everyone else kind of switched off and was like, okay, it's been cleared out. Let's get back to defending. <laughs> Yeah, he, he, he's played at a different level than most players in this team, and sometimes it really can show through. It's too bad they don't have three guys like that instead of just one. You mean DPs? Yeah. Yeah, you know, good DPs. I mean, they have a DP. Uh, it's just terrible. That's a novelty. It's even worse if you can bring three of them off the bench. Yeah. Oh, three DPs off the bench. And a guy <sighs> played Premier League football as well. Yeah. Crazy. All right, let's not dwell on the present. Okay, uh... <laughs> So let's look forward just a little bit. Currently, uh, this is the thing that's amazing, Dan. It's utterly amazing. Dallas is only three points behind uh, Portland, who's the seventh place team, which is uh, amazing to me. I hope the points yeah. are upside down. There you go. Yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, Lucci was uh, really mad about it yesterday. He said, you know, if we'd have won these two games, we'd have been comfortable in the playoffs. And, I, you know, I went back and looked at it. I was like, oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, if if you if you win one of them, you're uh, you're one win behind Portland in the race for seventh. Yeah, if, if they'd have won these two games, which by the way we said it was really important, and we'll explain why in just a minute, they would have been on twenty seven points. <laughs> they would have been tied for fifth place with RSL and Minnesota if they won these two games. And that you know, unfortunately, they did not. Obviously, so they are what your record says you are. Uh, despite the fact that they're only three points out of a playoff spot, let's be honest. The four, seven, and eight record. This is not a great team right now. It is better than it was a month and a half ago, particularly when you play the young kids, and particularly when Paxton is healthy. But there is a long way to go. And here's the real problem, Dan, and you know this. We are now to the dreaded six of seven on the road. This is the ass kicker of the schedule that we were worried about, that we knew was coming, that Lucci knew was coming, that everybody knew was coming. And Dallas, of course, remains. One seven and one on the road, only points in two games out of nine. That's absolutely brutal. Yeah, and then you've got well, you've got Houston, so a rivalry. Austin, who you know they're still talking about that game here. That that may be the final nail in the, in the coffin for jo- uh, Josh Wolf. Wow. So they're going to want to prove something, and well, they are terrible at the minute, so they're going to want to actually score and do stuff. Braille Salt Lake, you don't do too well there. Yeah. Um, you know, well, the, New the good York news City is going to be tough. It's, yeah. yeah. Sorry. The good news here is that m- m- the majority of these teams are teams that they're challenging for a spot, and quite a few of them are not very good at home, strangely enough. At Houston, Houston's 3 1 and 4. So roughly 500. Well, not even that. Uh, better than 500. But. Three wins, one loss, and a bunch of ties. So not stellar at home. Austin, two, seven, and two at home. Seven losses at home. That's um, unbelievable. So both of those games, theoretically, you think, okay, maybe we can get some points there. Unfortunately, RSL, as you said, five, two, and four at home. That's a very difficult place to play. They often stomp Dallas there. Then you get your one-game reprieve. San Jose comes to town, which makes that pretty much a must-win, right? They're only two, three, and five on the road. So 
I mean, they're a scrappy team. They love to compete, but it, you better win that game. Then you go to NYCFC, 7-2-1 and one at home. That's that's a game you rest players. Yeah, that you rest everybody because that's brutal. Then you go back to Houston, again, 3-1-4 and four at home. And then you finish that stretch with Vancouver, 3-3-2 three, three and two at home. And then you come back and have your big home stand, your 5-6 of six at home. So there's the keys, right? At Houston twice, at Austin, at Vancouver. Those four games you have to look at as we've got to get some points in some of these games to come out of the back of this road trip. Like if you go one, your one win is at home. If you go one and six, you're toast. There's no way. You have to come out of this six of seven on the road with a couple of points somewhere. And you got to look at that, particularly because Houston and Austin are behind you and Vancouver's behind you. So those four games, you have to do something on the road here if you want to make the playoffs. Yeah, because even that one home game, nothing's guaranteed. San Jose have, you know, they've had Dallas's number quite often in yep. the last couple of years. Um, Vancouver is is an extremely tough place for Dallas to go to. Uh, you know, yeah, Rail Salt Lake is effectively a write off, and New York City should be a write off. Uh, you shouldn't worry too much because about that. You're playing them, you know, slap bang in between the. Uh, San Jose home game and Houston away game, so you really need to have your players fit and ready, especially right now they're talking about physical and mental fatigue. Well, if you're on the road that much, uh, well, you're going to have games in all four, t- you know, every time zone um, yeah. in this stretch. Unfortunately, the reason why you have to do some business here on the road games is you do have this heavy-handed home stretch at the end, but you're looking at sporting, Minnesota, LAFC, you go to LA Galaxy, RSL and Austin, another rival, and then you finish at San Jose. So, you know, there's some, even though you got some home games in there, you got some really tough games. So it's like you have to figure out a way to dig in on this home, this road trip, even though it is six of seven. This six of seven is going to make or break your season. If you don't get something in here, if you don't find a way to get some points, it's it's over. There's no if you come through this stretch blank, with you know even just one win somewhere, even if it's the home game, it's it's not going to be enough. Yeah, and you've you've got to have uh, those those first three at home: the SKC, Minnesota LAFC. You need to have the momentum coming in off a good at least a good two game run from that Houston, uh, the second Houston game and Vancouver. You've got to have yeah something, or you might as well just treat them as games to give minutes to kids yeah you, you have to have a positive mindset coming off this road trip the road is very difficult so our standards for what is a decent road trip and when the team standards for what's a decent road trip are not the same as if this is a homestand you know if you can get some points here along the way give some people some hard fight then you can come into the homestand in a positive frame of mind and you have a chance that's what we say you have to be able to get some points out of this because if you if you get blanked on this road this six of seven on the road if you get basically blanked then you're going to come into the final home stretch a shattered team. The guys are going to have quit. Their minds are going to be all thinking about where they're going to be playing next year. You know, the guys will be thinking about who's going to coach his team next year. You know, Lucci, we know now for sure, 100%. He's in the last year of his deal. There is an option. Apparently, the team has not picked it up. And that matches what I've been saying for the last few months. You know, it co- coincides with the window being a. You know, they did their business before the window. They brought in Shun, they brought in Faco. They did their business a few weeks before the window. But other than that, they're definitely in a wait and see sort of mode here with Lucci to see if he can right this ship and get this team headed back towards where they believe it should be, which is a playoff team. Yeah, it's uh, definitely going to be an interesting uh, few weeks for, for Lucci. And uh, yeah, I would say that the stress kind of seemed apparent yesterday. Um, you know, so I mean, you know, just one one thing uh, for a bit of insight. The league rule is that 15 minutes after the game, the press conference begins. Uh, about 35, 40 minutes after the game ends, Lucci walks in looking extremely tired, and uh, he says, "You know, the team had just had a a minute, uh, like a moment together." Um, and then I didn't actually catch his opening statement, but it was in because it was in Spanish. But I mean, it was. Uh, pretty heated in part talking about 
um, physicality of the game, uh, physical fatigue, mental fatigue, and, uh, you know, a, a lot of hardships. Yeah, I definitely thought, even more so in the sporting game than the Seattle game, I thought Dallas looked particularly tired in that sporting game. Uh, they looked a little worn out. You know, they haven't had a, a huge slump yet this summer, and maybe that's because they've the whole season's been a slump, so maybe we just didn't recognize it. Or maybe the slump is upon us now, or it's about to be on us now with this road trip. But this comes back to the idea of we've you and I have talked a lot, and I'm sure the players were aware of how important these last two home games were. This is this is the thing. It's like you you wanted to have good vibes and good, feeling good about yourself. Like if they'd have won these two home games going into this thing, and you would have been looking at like, oh, we got a, a win and some points on the road, then we smoked our rival, and then we beat the two best teams in the Western Conference at home. You'd have been feeling great going into this road thing, and instead. You had that really positive couple of road points, smoked your rival, feeling great, and then you got skunked by the two best teams in the conference who showed how much better they really are than you are. And now you have this bad mindset and this bad feeling as you go into this brutal road stretch. Yeah, absolutely. And just, you know, even now you're kind of looking at it as, you know, a couple of weeks ago, it was, yeah, four goals against uh, LA, two in Kansas City, a late one in Seattle. It's progress. And now you're looking at us, okay, two in Kansas City, uh, yeah, one in, one against a team that was uh, about to play a League's Cup game. Great, you scored against one of the worst teams in the league, and then you got blanked twice at home, which, I mean, I'm going to find out when the last time that happens, but uh, it's definitely over eight years. Does this all come back to you, Dan, for me? And see if you agree with me here. Uh, we did it earlier in the podcast. But I honestly believe that these last few games, when Pomichol got knocked and then basically for, was only around for like the first quarter of the Kansas City game and then got lifted and then was not available for the Seattle game, we talked about the difference makers Kansas City has, the difference makers Seattle has. The Kansas City has probably got the league MVP. Seattle's got... The, this week's player of the week, Rui Diaz. You got guys that are at this different level. For FC Dallas, that dude is Paxton. And if you take that guy, that take that threat out of the game and bring on Obreon, who's a black hole of death on the field right now, and it shouldn't be starting the rest of the way at all. If you take your guy, your talisman, your 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 dude that everyone in the locker room feeds off his energy, your guy that everybody looks to to make a difference and be special. You take that guy out of the team. Is this what you get at home? Is these two shutouts? Yeah, I mean, I mean, look at this way. Uh, you know, you ask uh, who the best player is on any team. All right, that's your difference maker. It's your guy that can turn a loss into a draw or a draw into a win. For FC Dallas, that's Jimmy Mauer, yeah. goalkeeper. Yeah. You want that to be someone on the attacking side of the ball. Yeah. You know, for the first half of the season, I, I might have gone with Brian Acosta, but then, you know, he, he he tuned out right before the Gold Cup and then was gone for a bunch. And then since he's come back, he's kind of just been slowly getting back in the groove and he's not where he was at the beginning of the season. Uh, if Dallas is going to do anything, he better get back to where he was at the beginning of the season. But, you know, that's what you – that's a sort of a bare minimum you want out of an Acosta-type DP. You know, again, this – this club has a deficiency on the roster, you know? Yeah. But, I mean, even if even if Acosta is, I mean, that's still kind of, you know, he's still, you know, he's still more active on the defensive side of the ball and, and not really getting up the field enough to yeah. really dictate a game, whereas yeah. Paxton Pomaco and Nico Ladero, uh, you know, kind of any of these players around the league that, uh, you know, play in that more attacking role take yeah. the game by the scruff of the neck and, and dictate things. Yeah, as good as Acosta has been in the first half of the year, I don't think that he is that game-changing player. You're right. He's a stable player you can build upon, you know, like a uh, Zabio, not Zabio, <laughs> uh, the, the holding midfield, like Chris Armas used to be, or like um, the I Seattle. I Alonso. Yeah, I was about to, but that's not who I mean. I mean the Alonso that was with – Seattle, Ozzy Alonso, yeah. Ozzy Alonso, thank you. My brain was farting all over the place. Ozzy Alonso, you know, was for Seattle for a long time. Uh, like Kyle Beckerman was for Real Salt Lake for a long time. Acosta can be that kind of DP. He's not going to be 
a Ladero. He's not going to be a Rui Diaz. He's not going to be a Joseph Martinez. Paxson has that kind of ability. Um, you know, Jesus even doesn't have that that I, I've seen. Not that really special change the game moment ability. You know, yeah, that's his, that, uh, yeah. His decision making, just his critical thinking, sometimes doesn't, seems a little bit off. And um, you know, aside from that, actually, he did that up one nice run where he took the ball from a, a mauer pass and took it up to the edge of the box. But even then, it was kind of like got to the edge of the area, just kind of hit the ball at, at the keeper, not really. You know, not really looking for who was off on on either flank or to uh, you know place the ball. It was more of a well, I've got it here. I might as well just go for it now. Uh, whereas, I mean, Rui Diaz, perfect example, right? Takes that shot, hits Tafaro's legs. Mao has stepped a foot off his line. Rui Diaz sees that little tiny gap and just chips it over off the post. That yeah. is that's your game changer. Oh yeah, what a player he is! What did he cost? And, Something like you know, seven million dollars. <laughs> yeah. And and you know, and we've seen that from Paxton. Yeah. In in goals he scored or the assist to uh, Brian Acosta in that game against the uh, LA Galaxy that time. You know the the no look cut back to the edge of the area, or actually beyond the edge of the area for him to slam in. It was, you know, that that's the kind of vision and and. Uh, just, just the foresight in the game, the ability to read what other players are doing that you, you, you want from your, your, your guy who's going to push you on to greater things. Well, the team downplayed his injury, uh, seemed to think it's not that big of a deal. They did have an MRI on it. I knew that. I don't know anything about any kind of results. It's Obviously, a it's just a sprain. All right. Well, that makes me feel a little bit better uh, with the team down playing. I wasn't too worried about whether he was going to be back or not, that they were very clear that it's like, it's not related to the other stuff. To me, it's all related. If you're, it's like angles to, to chest on that kid is a mess. You know, it's all going to take time to put together, come back together. You know, it's he, he's probably, I mean, I'm no physical therapist, of course, but you know, when you have this endless parade of stuff all up and down the middle going wrong, you know, guys play different. They move different. They get hit different. And all of a sudden you get hit in other ways, trying not to get hurt. You get hurt, you know? So we'll have to hope for the backs for packs and, and I don't rush back yet. This team <laughs> needs that kid so badly. It's the only thing they have is that he's the guy that can make this thing happen. He's got to carry him to the play. If they're going to get in, it's going to be Paxton that's going to do it. Yeah, I'm a hundred percent on, uh, as uh, depression as that may be, uh, that your uh, your one hope is the guy that missed half the season injured. Well, Dan, what else do we want to talk about? Is there anything floating around in the world of FC Dallas that we need to hit on? I mean, I would hope there would be something positive. Uh, uh, I don't know what it would be. <laughs> um, <laughs> what do you have those results like you just had? No, no. I, I think one, one cool thing we saw this week um, – weirdly we saw from soccer america was that uh fc dallas on the women's side have uh taken the initiative to expand the buy-in partnership and are going to send uh, six players to train with uh buy-in frauen uh while they're playing in the uh, women's cup uh, over here against i think it's barcelona portland and someone else that's very cool uh it's good to see that relationship continue in, in, in new ways in the sense that there's an organizational relevancy here that happens because of that relationship. People in other countries know of FC Dallas a little more than they might not otherwise, you know, and they've, they've probably gotten kids in the Academy. They've gotten kids, the guys that have come to this team because of that relationship. So it'll be interesting to see if they find new ways other than this women's one to go forward with it. Um, you know, uh, I'd be interested to know if the two are even linked because you know, let's be honest, right? FC Dallas on the women's side and FC Dallas on the the MLS side is the slightest, barely, you know, there, there's not really a whole lot in common other than the name, um, and you know, the employment of some of the academy coaches that double up on the women's side. Yeah, I, I don't know how. Um... Gordon, who runs the uh, women's side of things, I don't know whether he would be able to negotiate that deal without going through the hunts. Um, you know, he may have raised the suggestion to them, you know, and had them sort of 
say, oh, that sounds like a great idea. Or maybe maybe Byron initiated that idea and said, you know, we would love to get involved with you guys on the girls' side too. You, you are correct that for the most part, they ignore the women's side, unfortunately. Um, I, I, I'd like to see them just have any kind of sort of inv- – you don't have to go to the top women's league, but, you know, treat it like it's a legit real thing. I think that would be really nice for them to do. And, and it's, it's kind of an unfortunate thing about the women's game in general is that – you know, those affiliated teams aren't thought of in some ways as part of the organization as much as they should be. Um, you know, so it'd be interesting even to know how, I guess, how uh, the structure is at Bayern. You know, are they effectively an affiliate team that just carries the name? Um, you know, for example, Real Madrid just they bought a women's team. They just yeah. they bought a women's team for, I think, three quarters of a million, and they were like, "Okay, you're gonna play in white kits now. You're, we're gonna we're gonna slap your name on the on uh, sorry, you're gonna slap our name on your jerseys, and uh, we'll give you um, a training field to play on." Uh, you know, we've seen uh, definitely in England the opposite happen where women's teams have started as a true like part of a club and then the clubs turned around and said hey times are tough we can't really afford it so can you drop the name oh yeah well if if the women's thing continues to progress and pick up some legs we already need somebody some help with the women's side we'll have to bring out some more people there's another reason why we have to bring out more people too dan i'm gonna get to in a minute in the meantime let's talk about north texas real quickly there are only two wins behind the first place team, even though they're way back in seventh place. Uh, and they only one tie behind, which is, oh, I'm looking at the wrong column. That's my bad. They're four losses behind, though. Union Omaha does not lose games. They either win or tie. Uh, that result against Chattanooga was pretty big. So assuming that they're going back to four teams in the playoffs, North Texas has a chance to get into that mix. Uh, as usual, Quill seems to be getting it straightened out over the latter half of the season. Obviously, this is probably their – not obviously – if you guys don't know, 95, 98% that this is the last run of North Texas in this league because the new MLS Reserve League is coming. Uh, we understand that that whatever they're going to call that Dallas Reserve team, probably North Texas SC, but maybe not, is going to be in the MLS League and not in USL 1. So uh, that'll be fascinating to watch how that process happens in terms of brand, if nothing else. But, um, you know, if you guys... Don't go watch North Texas SC. You should because it is a good soccer watching experience. There's plenty of good players there. I think there's a couple of guys that could help this team as depth pieces over the next couple of years, depending on which who's coach and which way things go. So there's definitely some good talent watching there. Over the back half of the season, you might see some more academy guys coming in. Uh, certainly, if if Dallas Dallas if North Texas is out of the picture, then you might see even more just to see what those kids can do. But it's good game watching there, Dan. I know you watch it from time to time. Yeah, I haven't uh, been out to a game at, at Globe Life Park, but I'm definitely uh, want to get to one before the end of the season. It looks uh, looks like it uh, be uh, a good bit of fun. Those uh, smaller, uh, intimate crowds and uh, just I mean, North Texas always play good good soccer. Uh, Quill uh, coaches a great game, uh, and, and yeah, it'd be, it'd be really interesting to see. They've got. Uh, a pretty interesting run of games coming up, uh, going to Madison uh, at the weekend and then uh, away to Union Omaha the next week. Uh, you know, before kind of hitting most of those lower mid-table teams. Uh, with a, actually, now they've got a pretty solid away run too. So, uh, yeah, yeah, it'd be, uh, it's, it's kind of funny how uh, things almost uh, can, can mirror the, between the first and second teams. Yeah, six of eight on the road. Yeah, they do have one more season at Globe Life Park. Original three year deal, three year lease. So uh, that also will be an interesting thing to keep track of. Um, speaking of lower division soccer, Dan, we we now know for sure that what we talked about before this really strong rumor the Austin Bowl might be moving to Fort Worth. Uh, certainly, there's some level of USL team probably happening over there in Fort Worth. We we understand behind the scenes that it's. Um, it's uh, the Texas United guys and Donnie Nelson skies that are involved in all that. Um, awesome bold, of course, immediately put out a statement saying we're not going anywhere right this minute. We're exploring all our options, whatever, quote unquote. So 
again, <laughs> we might have to get some more people, Dan, <laughs> because uh, there's a good chance there's going to be a new professional team here in town that might be playing USL championship level. That's a pretty high level of Fort Worth. That's going to take some serious coverage of that level of play. If it's at USL one, that would surprise me since the bowl is not a USL one team or a championship team, because the only reason you would buy them, if that is indeed what's happening is to circumvent the expansion methodology, really an expansion fee. You buy the team and move them a lot cheaper. They do have that modular statement stadium down there in Austin. So it is theoretically sort of movable. Yeah, I mean, I don't think the stadium itself would move. That's still going to be used by the rugby, uh, the Major League Rugby franchise. Um, I've, won, I've got a feeling that that is tied into the Circuit of the Americas ownership somehow or, or the Barcelona Escalera. But, uh, yeah, I mean, there's, you know, there's good options in, in Fort Worth, particularly if they want to build. Um you know, even in the even in the meantime, it's you know you can get into somewhere like TCU with a, that great f- uh, facility they've got. Well, our boy John uh, Leonard says that they'll play in one of the Keller ISD sort of facilities, but nonetheless, the bigger question and bigger point is that I, I've said all along that the Metroplex is plenty big enough in terms of both population and in distance that Fort Worth could easily support a USL Championship team. It's a plenty big enough city by itself. And you include all the other parts of Dallas that are relatively close to Fort Worth. You got a large population. There's a whole big significant part of the western half of the Metroplex that is anti anything called Dallas or thought of as Dallas. So, you know, there's a draw on that respect uh, over there. Um, there, there are a couple of minor league teams that might be wondering what the hell's going on. Uh, you know, whether you're looking at um, the Vaqueros or Denton, which is its own animal up in Denton, that's plenty of far enough away. You know, Texas United, if they are indeed involved, will that brand transition over, you know, versus like they're not going to call it the Fort Worth Bowl, I wouldn't think. I don't know. Um, I know Texas United is putting their academy that they're putting in that plays both USL Academy and MLS Next. I believe it's kind of over in the Fort Worth sort of area, I understand. Yeah, yeah that's what uh, they've been uh, trying to source players from. Yeah, uh, so it's going to be a fascinating process to watch. And again, we might need some people, so... Yeah, and and I don't know if uh, you know you forgot one thing about your uh, like groups that would go to games. Disgruntled FC Dallas fans is a very big group. Yeah, that there is a big disgruntled FC Dallas fans group, particularly some that live downtown. <laughs> you know, people have joked with me about it. Would USL have the cojones to take a plop a USL team down at the Cotton Bowl and see what they can do there? I mean, that would be ridiculous. Well, I mean, um, I, I don't think it would happen. I think it would be over in Fort Worth, but yeah. Uh, but even you know, you look at the Diablos and Vaqueros. You know, those the support of the the core support of their teams are, are people that did go to FC Dallas games. You know, back in the uh, the Inferno days, the early da- Dallas Beer Guardian days. You know, and have, have over time been kind of put off by. You know certain actions from uh, from from members of staff. So I mean, there's there's every year there's a growing uh, there's a there's a growing catchment of potential uh, people for for this new Fort Worth team. Oh, just, you know. And obviously we are kit nerds. Yeah. Did you notice that the Austin Bold used to have these really fun teal black and gold bespoke kits and this year they have these plain i bought them off the rack black puma kits yeah i i yeah they used to have i mean it wasn't my favorite color but at least they had some cool stripes going and some good stuff going on and then this year it's a little bland maybe they're in a cost cutting mode as well um strangely enough a whole bunch of teams are sporting that hexagonal Puma kit. That thing was super popular with teams this year. I've That's noticed because it was super cheap. Is that what it was? I noticed a bunch of teams weren't it. Yeah, All right. it's just kind of funny. I saw it the other day. I was like, oh, that's that's interesting. They've uh, they're really setting themselves up for uh, not having that, not not, not uh, you know just just replacing a badge, not having to worry about color schemes or anything else. Yeah, they got a blank slate, a solid black this year, which is uh, you know perfect for slapping on whatever color scheme you want going in the future. All right, the last thing we have to do, Dan, was something that we promised last episode we would do. We're just barely past the midpoint. Last week would have been better, but here we are. We're going to do a couple of uh, players of the season so far for FC Dallas. 
let's do uh, MVP, defensive player, and not rookie, but sort of young player, for lack of a better term, from each of us. Um, Peter's not going to participate because Peter's not here. So I'm going to let you go first, Dan. Who's your M- MVP for FC Dallas for the first half of the season? Uh, Jimmy Mauer. You're going with Jimmy Mauer? Absolutely. I think, uh, don't get me wrong, uh, Brian Acosta was uh, leading the way up until a couple of games before the Gold Cup. But uh, Jimmy Mauer has been the the one consistent player from March until now. Or April, whenever we start the season. All right, I'm going to stick with Brian Acosta. I think Brian Acosta has been, talent-wise, start of season to now, I think he's been the best player on this team. There's been many games where he's by far the best player on this team. He had one letdown before he left town, and maybe one letdown other than that, and he's been phenomenal. Uh, the Gold Cup interrupted the flow just a little bit, but he, I'm sticking with him on the top. All right. Defensive player of the year, and this is part of why I was willing to do that. I'm going to go with Jimmy Maurer as defensive player of the year. He's been by far the most consistent defender on this team. Uh, everybody else has either been hurt or in and out or lackluster in performance, or we've seen a bunch of different guys in a bunch of different spots. Jimmy Maurer has been the consistent rock wall in the back. Statistically, in terms of Goals against, he's not there this year because the whole collective team is not, but he's still performing at a phenomenal le- level. Listen to the broadcast on the last game. Mark uh, Dodd, who's one of the great keepers in this club's history, talked about how much he loves Jimmy Maurer and how reliable he is, what a great leader is, what a communicator and organizer he is. So much about keeping is about positioning and knowledge and and the brain of soccer, and that's why guys they play keeper a lot longer than any other position. Jimmy Maurer's got all that. You, you've got a good, if you want, five, six more years out of him probably, even though he's already, I think, 31. So uh, Jimmy Maurer's my defensive player of the year so far. Yeah, I'd wholeheartedly agree with you there on on Maurer. Um, you know, his shot-stopping ability, as you mentioned, you know, is, is fantastic. His command, his communication, you know, the, the positioning, everything that – every mental aspect and uh, – I guess fundamental of goalkeeping. He's uh, you know just uh, so excellent on might not have maybe the athleticism of uh, of a Jesse Gonzalez or or somebody like that, but uh, I think you know it's kind of like the old adage that Gary Neville used to say: "I was never the fastest player, but I'd always put myself in the right positions." Um, as much as you can adapt that to goalkeeping, I would, uh, you know, love to say there's uh, there's some space for Brisson and Nikosi to fire eye to uh, to get a shout in there, but I mean, you know, both of them just uh, maybe haven't had the uh, the longevity yet in this season to um, to warrant anything more than a shout out for you know for a, a half season award. So absolutely, one hundred percent, Jimmy Mauer. So your MVP and defensive player of the year, both Jimmy Maurer. Unfortunately. Yeah. All right. Yeah. That's that's something about this team. All right. So it's your turn to go first again. Who's your young player of the season so far? I think you've got to go Ricardo Pepe. Um, you've got a guy earning, you know, 2 million in real money and 2.9 in the, uh, you know, aggregated money or average money, uh, who is your owner's pet project and you've gone and displaced him, you've scored a few goals, you've got an all-star appearance. Okay, things are quietened off a little bit, but you, his game is growing constantly. Uh, we've seen him come out, we've seen him drop down for balls, we've seen him actually play a couple of nice cross-field passes, longer passes, add in a little bit more to his range, um, and just kind of staying switched on, because you know, uh, uh, in his uh, earlier games, I was going to say as a younger guy, he's still 18, um, you, you would see times where the ball wouldn't come his way and he'd switch off for a couple of minutes. And we're seeing him more engaged, more focused. His attitude's changing a lot. Came into the season kind of with a bit of a cocky streak, uh, you know, like being the guy. And then he's humbled off a little bit more and just kind of found a really good balance there to where he can have the intensity, but maybe not the, uh, you know, the childishness that can come with just being like a, having that kind of almost like I'm the guy mentality. Yeah, I, I agree with you wholeheartedly that Pepe is the young player of, of the year so far. I, I find that he's, when he's focused only on the field and he's not hearing talk, 
that he's better. You know, coming into this season, all the stuff over the winter, the Byron stuff, whatever, he got a little, you know, out of sync. And now again, the hat trick got him the attention, the all-star game stuff, a little bit out of sync perhaps. It's important for a guy like Lucci to burst that bubble occasionally and check him a little bit and keep him motivated and keep him pushing and keep him fixated when he's complacent like everybody else. When you're complacent, you're not going to make a progression. He's a kid that still needs a lot of progression. So he needs to be uncomfortable all the time. And that's going to be down to Lucci. And I think Lucci knows that, uh, you know, Ricardo has the greatest nickname in the history of sports. So he does have that badge of honor to carry around. <laughs> and uh, I'm super excited for where it's going to go. Uh, I like, you know, people are now keying on him. People are now watching him. All the attention's on him. He's going to have to push through this wall and find a little something in himself to some drive. Not that he doesn't have drive because he's always been very driven. It's, uh, it's worth, oh, sorry. I didn't yeah, go ahead. No, go ahead. I was going to say two things, uh, two little strings to his bow. Uh, MLS said it has got together for their half season awards, and Pepe was young player of the year for the whole league. Oh. And that all star appearance, that's a coach's pick from Bob Bradley. That's not a, you know, a commissioner's pick just to give FC Dallas a player. That's not a, a weird fan vote that can be influenced by whoever. That is a coach that said, yeah, this guy's making an impression in the league. Yeah, people are talking about this kid. Foreign clubs are talking about this kid and watching this kid. People around the league now have awareness of him. You know, we, we've talked about him for years, of course, and think very highly of him and his, in his future, and we still think he's got everything it takes to get to the top. You know, it's just important man management. You're talking about an 18-year-old kid, you know, to keep that stuff in check and keep him in focus, and that's going to be Lucci. You know, it's it's an organization as, as a whole, really, in a way, to not – overplay their hand with him and and get him distracted from the field because 18 to 21 22 these are huge years for him and you want him watching the field and focus on the field and not you know doing all this crazy off-field stuff all the time so um important for the people around him as much as it is him this next phase of his development right what's up next well, honestly, I think that's pretty much everything. I mean, that's uh, 70 minutes of content. I, I think we've gone through pretty much everything I had on my list. How about you? I mean, you know, I'm good. We were in a nice uh, positive place there. Yeah. Stopping with a good positive Ricardo Pepe hype. Okay, so, Dan, we mentioned earlier on the show, Third Degree, the podcast, you know this, brought to you by Soccer 90. Brand new Dallas Tornado shirt being trumpeted here for the first time ever it's available to our listeners before everybody else just go to the website it'll be there by the time you hear this you can see a picture of it on this podcast uh image that comes with it or on our website i'm sure you can go find it it's kind of a bluish sort of Dallas tornado shirt rather than gray super cool i'm gonna go buy one i love it uh you can get that shirt only at soccer90.com while supplies left don't forget our code 25 percent off code is third degree three r d d e g r e e just like the website and everything else we do called third degree only soccer90.com all right dan again thank you for being here sorry peter had the groin pull and couldn't make it well we had to carry the show and i'm sure all our listeners now know how important <laughs> peter is his professionalism to hosting the podcast i am not a host but you produce. I do. I do produce, but I'm not a talker talker guy. I'm not an on air talent. I'm not a radio guy. Peter's got that silky smooth radio voice. Uh, we miss him and his flow when he's not around. And his FC Dallas curiousness. Oh, yes. Yeah. So thank you, FC Dallas curious fans. Thanks for tuning in to episode 124 or 100 Matt Hedges, if you prefer. And we'll, uh, we'll talk to you again soon on next week's edition of Third Degree, the podcast. Thomas Roberts debut. Third degree, the third degree nap podcast. Third degree, the third degree nap podcast. Third degree, the third degree nap podcast. Third degree, the third degree nap podcast.